you tired of watching hours of confusing videos by guitar music theory experts on YouTube and still not understanding a darn thing they're on about? Then you need the Song Songwriting Inspiration app. For only $5, you can organize 6,000 guitar chords into relative major and minor keys and get tons of fresh new ideas for more sophisticated chord progressions and songs. Downloading Song is like downloading music theory straight into your brain. Link is in the description. Hey, how's it going dudes and dudettes? Brad the Guitologist here. This is part two of this night video, this PA that I featured a while back. It's actually been several months ago at this point that I featured the beginning video of this conversion that we're going to do on this thing. The problem with it was really it was going to be a very, very involved uh, conversion. This thing needs all kinds of shit. We're going to have to come in here and completely redesign it essentially and it was one of those situations where I have a lot of stuff in line and I had some other things that were not going to take quite so long and I really needed to push out at the door so I, I pushed a couple things ahead of this because I wanted to get those things out to customers who'd been waiting on those as well about as long as this so this should be a really fun one and it should be an awesome amp by the time we're done uh, I will put a card up here in the corner if you want to go check out part one but this is the one that had the mercury vapor uh, type 83 rectifier in it that just really glows a spooky kind of a blue purple color uh, this thing is also unique in that it has a uh, driver tube which is a I think it's a 6g6 something like that uh, that drives the uh, f the uh, phase inverter tra uh, transformer so this thing has a transformer as a in, as a phase inverter instead of a tube before the output uh, it has two Coke Bottle 6L6s, which, I mean, this should make an awesome guitar amplifier. I mean, on paper, this thing should be awesome. The problem is it's going to need every single capacitor replaced. It's going to need a complete redesign of the, of the you know, the whole circuit. Uh, it's got a lot of stuff that it just doesn't need uh, for a tube guitar amp. And we're going to have to remove a lot of stuff. It's going to need everything to work, so even down to the power switch I, I i noticed that the power switch wasn't working correctly when i tried to test it the last time the voltages were extremely low uh, on this when i tried to test it uh, last time <clears throat> and it was one of those situations where because of the low voltage uh, it could have been that uh, some of these capacitors over here that were extremely leaky and you can see like physically leaky like we've got a bunch of electrolyte and stuff. I don't know if you're going to be able to see it really, but there's crystallized electrolyte like everywhere where maybe one or more of these uh, these cap cans had exploded at one time. So we've got, and some of them are even still hooked up now, which is kind of scary. And this thing is from 19, like 1940. Uh, so, I mean, we're talking about an extremely old amp. All the stuff is pretty much going to have to go. Complete redesign. So yeah, let's go forward on this, man. See what we can do with it. Okay, I think I've tentatively decided on a design that I want to uh, take with this. I've got the Gibson Amplifier book out because uh, in this Amplifier book in the back, there's a CD-ROM that has the entire uh, Master Service Manual in it with all of the Gibson Amp um, schematics and good PDF format. And the one that I think I'm going to try to sort of uh, clone here is the GA75 Recording Amp. And this is the earliest version that has 6SJ7 and 36SC7s. Now the amp that we have here in front of us has a S SJ7s up front, two of those. It has an SC7 as well. And then it has this weird tube, which is not really... This might be actually something that I removed from the circuit entirely. But then we have the SC7 right here. And the thing is... Uh, there's an SC7, like I said, there's there's one that's actually being used in this amp. The SC7 is being used for the phase inverter. But this, we won't need a phase inverter because it has 6F6G tube pushing signal through this transformer. And the transformer is acting as the phase inverter. So we're basically going to keep the output stage. We're going to keep everything from this 6F6G over. Uh, in the output. We're basically going to keep that the same. Uh, in the power supply, 
We're gonna rework this a little bit probably, but generally we will keep it the same. We're gonna have, we're gonna try to use this 83 rectifier tube, this mercury rectifier tube, because I mean, frankly, it's kind of cool. Um, you don't see that hardly in any amplifiers and it would just be a cool, it's kind of what set this, sets this amp apart in a way. It's kind of what's special about it. It's got that mercury vapor uh, rectifier. And if, if this ever goes bad, you could either get another one or at that point, then you could you know, change it out to something else. But I think I'm gonna try to keep this. I'm gonna have to rework the primary side because we've got the switch on the on the opposite side of the fuse. So we'll, we'll sort all that mess out. We had a really low voltage before when we tested this thing. I mean, really low. We only had it dialed up about halfway. So I'm wondering whether or not this rectifier tube really needs to get hot in order to operate properly. And that's probably the case. That would be my guess with this mercury vapor. It has to get, you know, good temperature before it'll actually conduct correctly. So it's possible that will be fine, but we just don't know quite yet. So we'll have to see what we need to do there. The, of course, we're going to try to, you know, keep this uh, uh, choke in here because that's just a nice thing to have in the amp. It, it'll really help smooth out ripple. We're going to have to, again, remove this jack, which is a weird thing we discussed in the last video. That was, I think that connected to an outboard rheostat and and you could use that on some part of the stage if you wanted to turn the music down remotely that's, uh, that's essentially i think what that is but we won't need it of course in a guitar amp and we're going to have some tubes left over some things that we might be able to do i mean i don't know like i said we might remove this uh tube here or we could even turn it possibly into a tremolo uh, that's one thought it's something that we could possibly do but we definitely don't need it because we're going to have a 6sj7 coming into a an sc into the 6f6 uh, so i mean we're going to have plenty of, i think plenty of gain in this amp we might just tie this line to ground bypassing this remote jack uh, on this tube and just run this tube as is and just have a, a another gain stage there so I don't know. I haven't really quite decided, but that's that's a possibility. We'll see. And that's another thing, of course, too, that would make this amp unique is if we left that in there. So, I, you know, I don't know. Like I said, we'll, we will see. But so far, tentatively, like I said, what I want to do, I want to put one of the channels uh, just, I want to basically copy this on one of the channels, and I want to leave the other channel essentially as it is. Um, but the problem with it is I might have to redesign it slightly because it has this um, it's like a basically a battery cell here uh, somebody pointed out that that this is not a and it looks like on the schematic it looks like the symbol for a, a condenser but it's not apparently it's a battery cell and what what it is in the amplifier if you if we look in here it's one it's these guys right here and I was kind of wondering what these were when I was first uh, looking at this thing, but uh, but that's exactly what they are. And I, I mean, these are going to have to be pulled out of here, I think. But I'm not quite sure. Somebody said they're probably not good anymore. But heck, if I know, I have no ex I have no experience with these. Um, this is something that you just I mean, I've never seen before in anything that I've worked on that I recall. If I have, I probably gutted it and just didn't think anything of it. But um, yeah, this is kind of a new one on me, so we'll have to figure out what to do here. But one of these channels may end up staying uh, very similar, so it'll be uh, grid biased, and the other one will be cathode biased on the first stage. And then yeah, we'll just kind of figure it out from there. We're gonna have to do a lot of freaking work on this thing, man. I'm just, I've been kind of dreading it for a while. I've known this was coming, and the thing is, it's just there's so much, there's so much crap that's gonna have to come out of here. It's almost. It's almost going to be more efficient just to gut it, but I hate doing anything like that. Uh, what we might do on the preamp is just start at the just start at the beginning. We'll start over here. We'll gut one half of, of it and rewire it. We're going to have to get rid of this one anyway because it's not needed. So we'll clip this out of circuit. And yeah, like I said, yeah, just go from there. Okay, just a little update here on how far we've gotten so far. Uh, you can see this area looks a lot different. I have removed quite a few components and what I've decided to do is actually uh, on one of these 
inputs. It's going to be it's going to be basically like the Gibson model GA75 and on the other input I'm going to do something more like a Fender Champ with the SJ7 in the first position. So we're going to have, you know, a bit of a tweed sound on on one side and and actually the other one sounds really tweedy as well, but you'll at least get two different uh, tones out of it. It's already looking a little bit better as far as the looks are concerned. I I put one of these components on my little tester and uh, it said it didn't recognize the component. It was like either a faulty or unrecognizable component. So I don't know what these things are supposed to... Like I said, I've never even ran across any of these. And this was supposed to be some kind of battery. And I think this was changeable. Like um, you could actually you know, change this little bit right here. Obviously, it was supposed to hold some kind of charge, I presume. At this juncture, it's pretty useless. We're going to go with a completely different design, and I think it's going to end up being a lot better. All right, we are back with this vintage night amplifier. This thing has been just kind of a bane on my existence for a little while because it's just been... It's been sitting in the corner, kind of beckoning me to delve into it. And I knew if I delved into it, this was going to be a very serious project uh, that wasn't going to be all that easy. Um, I've had to redo the entire front end of this thing. And that part is pretty much done. And you can see I've started tracing out the schematic that I'm creating here. This is the power supply into these stages. And I've got everything from that node over completed so now I've got to get the uh, the next gain stage and then out to the uh, output completed but the problem is most of the components at least all the caps for sure and probably even some of these resistors are going to need to be replaced uh, I replaced and checked all the resistors in this area some of these I kept for now the values are a bit high I'm gonna see what they sound like before I go changing things like these 500 K plate resistors I might drop those down to maybe 220 or something like that we'll see so a couple of these values aren't really set in stone that's why I've got it marked in pencil this second channel down here although this is gonna have a lot more power obviously than a chant this is the front end stage of a SC1 champ or, or there it's very close to that this is grid leak biased this one uh, as you can see here the yeah this 5 meg uh, grid leak resistor right here so yeah you're gonna have basically two different channels to choose from and it'll give you a probably slightly different response uh, different touch sensitivity but you know it'll give you some options so <clears throat> there's that we've got the front end done as you can see I've got a lot of these capacitors left all these will have to be yanked out now I'm probably going to come up here and yank out pretty much everything having to do with the power capacitors there are four of these big capacitors under here I think I'm just probably going to strip out almost all of this up in here this will um, be pretty much all gone and that way it'll strip it back to uh, something that you know I can start from a, basically start over reconstructing the power section i'm gonna to have to do something about all this stuff down here too this big power resistors i mean check this out right here i mean this is this is not safe look at that if this got i mean this probably never got moved in a way that would be dangerous because it's kind of been pushed out but i mean first of all look at the state of that soldering job right there and second of all look i mean i can just push this thing slightly and it's right into that transformer so this resistor is probably going to be replaced entirely. Um, we've also got this little resistor right down here that's kind of just flopping around. Look at this. This one, I mean, basically this resistor is about the only thing holding this bigger resistor in place. That resistor and a couple of wires, just the tension on the wires. I mean, obviously that's not right. Then you've got another resistor here. I'm going to have to sort all this stuff out. We've got three big resistors over here. Um, I'll probably just strip those out and start from scratch and just do the entire power section again. I've got these. These I think are coupling caps or maybe even uh, I don't know. They might be some kind of uh, ble you know bleeder ca capacitors. Um, you know stabilizing the thing. I'm not even really sure yet but uh, we'll see. I've got these two 
capacitors right here that I don't even think are the right values that replace some capacitor over here that exploded at one point. And you can see all the milky crystallized crap that's over there. So yeah, a lot of this stuff's going to just have to come out still and get a little further along with it, but it's slow going. I'm having to basically go one component at a time, you know, to figure out exactly uh, what needs to come out, first of all, and what I want this thing to come out like. So I'm designing it kind of as I go through. So anyway, I started at the input and I've gotten this far, so let's continue. Okay, this is an update again on this night amplifier. It's uh, the next day and I've done a lot. <laughs> As you can see here, I've got a lot of wires uh, hanging off the unit. All kinds of stuff has been clipped. All the electrolytic section that's over here, I also took out, well, I took out a bag full of stuff, essentially. I've taken out all the electrolytic capacitors. I've taken out a couple of the other uh, Coupling caps, I uh, took out the uh, the little switch jack that was up here and all of the associated stuff with that. And I started working over here on the power supply and this thing is just gonna need a lot. And this is one of the reasons I had been so loath to dive into this thing because I knew it was gonna be a lot of work just looking at the bottom. This is not a walk in the park, folks. It's not as easy as it looks. You know, we skip around a lot. Channels like mine and Uncle Doug's and uh, D-Lab and other channels that do work on amplifiers like this. There's a lot of skipping around involved when you watch the video and time is seriously condensed down and you're not seeing the whole thing most of the time. Even on some of my longer videos, you're not seeing anywhere near the entire project. You know, and time-wise, uh, the money that was sent along with this amp for me to complete this has already been burnt through and then some. And the thing is, it's just, I'm basically gonna give away uh, a lot of time on this. And that's one of the reasons it's it's no longer economical for me to be doing it. It no longer makes sense for me to take in outside work. Uh, it's just one of those things and it's, you know, it is what it is. I can't continue to justify uh, taking in all the, you know, problem childs, uh, you know, that are out there I just can't do it it's not feasible um, you know and then you look over here on something like this I was actually going to replace uh, this big resistor it's probably overkill in this thing anyway um, and we've got a lot of blackness over here so I don't know if this transformer right here um, was taken out by heat or something I'm not sure what's going on with that but you can see it's really black it's just a, basically a smoothing choke in the power supply. So if it's continuous, it's good. I think I might have already tested that, but I can't remember for sure. But I, I think there was a question about it. But all this stuff is, all the associated stuff is going to have to come out. And this whole power supply section needs to get an entire redesign and a rethink. But you can see right here, look at this. Not only was this area really badly soldered when I got this. I mean, look at this. And it was also flopping around, as you saw in a previous clip. But also, look at this. Look at this wire right here. It's just completely bare, you know, about a good half an inch. Or that might even be, that's uh, more like a full inch away from this. From here to here is like a full inch. And you just got bare wire dangling there. And the wire was up underneath there, touching God knows what. It's no wonder. <laughs> There's a lot of blackness over here. It probably, probably smoked it sometime in the past but yeah man just so much stuff and you can see all these leads run in hither and thither all over this thing uh back and forth and you've got all these you see all these black leads these big thick black ones all of these these are all leads that are leading to and from the controls that are up on the faceplate so you've got all these long leads uh to the controls and back it's a lot of distance to cover when you're carrying guitar signal you know, our actual audio signal. And then you've got some of the situations where, like right here, for instance, you can see this red wire. And I'm going to replace this red wire again because I replaced it with a wire that was a bit too thin. I'm going to, I think I'm going to replace that again. But that's going to, that's the wire that was broken and cracked up. It's going up to the, da the dash lights. Uh, that's one of the lights. And this is the other light right up here 
this red one and this black one, this pair. So you can see where these are going into these grommets and this these are carrying signal and that's carrying AC. And it's just going right through that grommet, right at the same grommet. And that right there too. You've got actual design issues uh, also that, I mean, if you were going to really do this right and you were going to, you know, completely re redesign this from the ground up, strip it and just do something different in it. Those are the kinds of concerns you would want to design around. You'd want to try to get the AC stuff away from those wires that are carrying the signal. And it's just, you know, man, this is just a lot. It's just a lot. Fuck. I, I've, I've, I've already spent, I spent most of the night last night, okay? So just to give you an idea, uh, all the time I've already spent on this. And then there's uh, all the work that's been done and all this work to, to clip all this stuff out. I mean, it was hours because what I'm doing is, I don't know if you see it or not, but I'm actually labeled this one. But I'm actually trying to trace things out as best I can and clip them off so that I don't, um, so that I don't completely lose where things have gone. So I, you know, I can have some idea where it all needs to go back or what, what kind of redesign I need to do. So I'm slowly also, uh, drawing out a schematic, you know, that's going to show my changes and that's, you know, that's time consuming as well. So it's just, just to let you know, you know, what's involved in something like this. I know it looks easy when you're watching it on a video. It seems like, why can't, why can't this guy just churn out, you know, video after video of, uh, of, of this, you know, kind of content. And then also why can't he do the shit post Friday stuff also? And then, you know, this is why, cause it's not only that, but it's also this, it's also this camera and you, you know, that I have to consider and I have to consider, uh, you know, the presentation of this as a storyline, you know, okay, what parts do I want to film and what parts can I get away with not filming and trying to create a story out of this whole thing. But you can see so much, you know, it ha is in the way as well. You know, this is not like a Marshall or a Fender, uh, you know, that's really well laid out, that's on a board and it's, everything's really straight and you know exactly what's going where, where and you can see all the, you know, you can see everything basically clearly laid out in front of you. Well, this is a spaghetti mess where you've got wires going up underneath stuff, you know. Well, over here, for instance, too. I mean, you can just see the stuff on top of stuff, you know. It's just like a big mass of stuff. And you have to trace all that out physically. You have to, <laughs> you know, you have to follow each and every path and trace it. And you also have to test every component in there. And over here, look. Uh, underneath this, what? Look at all this wire. Look at all this spaghetti mess over here too. You know, so you've got all this, and then you've got you've got to deal with stuff that is no longer going to be useful in your new design, like this weird uh, connector. Well, no, actually, uh, I'm sorry, that's a uh, rectifier. But up here, this weird connector. You got this other con connector here, which is going up to the uh, which is going up to the dashboard. That's carrying signal for the. Uh, for the decibel meter and the lights for the decibel meter. So I'm going to have to factor this into my final design. And that's not something I'm used to, uh, you know, having to factor into a design for guitar because you just don't see this kind of stuff on guitar amps. So that's, you know, that's a new concern. So it just, you know, there's a lot to it. Just letting you know. And then there's all this stuff up here too. Uh, all of these uh, auxiliary plugs all of the wiring for these auxiliary plugs I may end up having to take out of here or just taken out. I don't necessarily have to, uh, but it would be a good idea probably to try to limit that as much as possible because it's just it's just more AC that's just kind of running around on the chassis and you know it it increases the risk of you know something failing and a live wire hitting the chassis and it's just a safety issue first of all and second of all you know it's it's a hum issue where you're just going to get the more ac stuff that you put on a unit like this the more hum you're going to get and this thing is probably going to hum like a monk on a mountaintop anyway because of all these lines that you've got running to and fro and these lines by the way these were cut off because these were going up here to uh, uh to the assembly that went to the switch this remote jack right here this thing okay this jack actually 
was completing the circuit for the 6SA7 tube right here for the biasing of that. You see here the bias, there's a cathode, it comes off of that, goes through a, a 3K resistor, and then it goes down here through this switch. So when you plug this jack in, it disengages the biasing for this tube, I guess, and turns it off. It's so, you know, if you're across the stage, you have some means to turn the volume up and down. Uh, so it basically would put a resistance in series with, with this resistance and turn this tube on and off. So it would, it would re-bias this tube to turn it, basically turn, it, turn the volume up and down. Uh, it's not, it's, first of all, it's not a very good idea design wise, and it's just something that's not going to be needed for guitar amp. So we're going to, you know, obviously remove that. I'm not even sure if we're going to use this six SA seven tube at all. We may just bypass that and go directly to the six SC seven. I think an SJ into an SC and into a six F six G and that's the driver for the phase inverter and then to the output. I think that's going to be plenty. So we may just even bypass this tube altogether, but you know, there's, a, there's just so much to this guys. I mean, it's, it's not as easy as it looks. It's way more involved. There's a hell of a lot more time than you will ever know. Um, so I'm just letting you know, that's why, you know, a, a few of you guys too have had amps with me for a long time. And, you know, I'm sensitive to that fact, and I realize that. Uh, but this is why, you know, you get stuff like this, and it it kind of clogs up the runway, so to speak, so the other airplanes can't take off, you know. And it's and looking at something like this sitting here beside my desk for, for as long as it has been here has just been, you know, has, has just been a daunting prospect. And I know, you know, why are you sitting there talking about it? Just get it done, you know. That's true but then you wouldn't have this bit of film. All right, so here we are back with this thing. I've gotten a little further along. I've gotten uh, all the old cans removed because we're not going to need those anyway. There's no sense in even leaving them in. Half of them are pretty exploded, so our, uh, our old parts bag is ballooning. I've gotten rid of all the old power section stuff that was down here, measured out this choke. 107 ohms is what it measures, and I'm not really sure if that's what I expect to see or not. I'm going to compare that to some of the other chokes that I have around here and see if that's close to what I would expect. It seems like it might be high, but at least it's not open. Another thing I want to draw your attention to is just how sloppy some of the wiring is. Now, a lot of it is, you know, is fair, I would say, um, but a lot of it's also kind of sloppy like this for instance I mean look at this look at the amount of wire that they left on this on these leads here to just go right there why didn't they just chop that and go directly to it instead of doubling that down and shoving it up under all that stuff you know it just just contributes to the overall sloppiness of the thing so we're gonna really get in here and try to clean this up as much as possible it's just slow going I'm I'm basically just you know, I'm sipping on my coffee, I'm watching uh, ESPN's documentary on the 1990s Bulls, The Last Dance, over here <laughs> at the same time that I'm doing this. I'm getting it done, a little out of time, we're making progress, but I just want to draw your attention is how sloppy some of it is. I mean, that right there, obviously I'm going to chop that. And actually, it's a good thing to shorten these wires anyway, as one of these that was tucked up under here has got a, has got a lot of cracking on it. You just got a lot of insulator loss so it's just you know it's going to be good to to cut these down regardless okay so i've been giving this a great deal of thought i'm going to show you what i kind of have in mind here now I've, I've redesigned these first stages so you can kind of ignore this to some degree but we have a control here a volume control on each of these channels i'm going to keep that control and basically use that as a preamp gain control now these in this design they get mixed together here and I'm going to keep that concept as well. So they will get mixed together after the first stage. So instead of I'm going into a 6SA7 stage like we have in this amp, I am going to clip this completely out of the circuit, bypass it. And I'm going to, instead of going into an SC7 in parallel like this one is uh, designed, I'm going to split these two triodes out. And I'm going to go into one triode gain stage and then directly into another triode cathode follower stage and then into a tone stack of some sort, probably just a, a bass and a treble tone stack uh, with a fixed mids, I would, I'm would. i guessing so far. I haven't quite 
I haven't quite figured out the tone stack that I'm going to use yet, but uh, that's the that's the idea. Then we're going to go into uh, replacing this with a uh, master volume control, then into the six f6 driver to the phase inverter and on out so this will be this will all be fairly similar from basically this point over but from from here to here this whole section is going to be completely redesigned uh, it's going to take a little bit of time for me to clip it out of the actual amplifier I've got to remove a bunch of stuff basically uh, all of this has got to go um, I've got to, you know, peel back all of these leads and basically see where all they're all going. I've got to tie in the six volt lines. I've got to, you know, basically bypass that tube. And yeah, it's just going to take a little bit of time, but that's kind of the idea at the moment. Several song-filled hours later. Okay, so we finally have this thing completed. At least I believe it's completed. I've drawn the entire new schematic to go along with it we're going to go through all the changes that were made first i want to point out that uh just i mean look at all the additional space that's left in this thing i mean from where it was if you flash back to what it looked like initially all this stuff is completely gone of course we've thinned out a lot of stuff down here this uh this socket is no longer being used for a tube it's just being used for connection points um, and i want to go through like i said i want to go through the schematic um, but a couple of notes here the uh, uh these sockets up here that look like they are auxiliary sockets for for uh, ac plugs for like 100 you know 120 volt plugs for other equipment it's, that's not what that is those are actually plugs for speakers if we look at the schematic the original schematic we'll see here on the secondary of the output transformer uh, here you can see the 500 ohm 250 8 6 4 and 2 ohms go into the switch and then after the switch you have these plugs which are the speaker outs so they were actually using uh, two prong regular um, power sockets as speaker outs which is interesting I've of course I've changed that now uh, you could still use these I suppose if you had these plugs because I did leave them plugged in I didn't think it was uh, that important to remove them considering they weren't you know it wasn't a bunch of uh, AC lines there like I thought it was initially so I didn't end up having to remove those or you know cut them out of circuit I just uh, piggybacked off of them and put this jack in here but you can see like i said over here on the secondary we had one two three of those and then you had this headphone jack here this is the meter over here i did leave the meter in circuit uh that's the only thing i did not draw on the new schematic that i made is the meter but the meter is just tied in the same way that's shown here but yeah that's pretty much uh that now if we look here at what's going on with the power section uh, just to give you a rundown of the power stuff uh, you've got the secondary coming out, you've got node 1 right here, and you have uh, these two 47 microfarads. These are in series, uh, which is creating about a 25 or so microfarad, 24 microfarad uh, capacitor node here. Uh, then it goes through the choke, then you have node number 2, node number 3 right here, node number 4, and then over here node number five right here for this one um so you have five different power nodes and that's how those are laid out down here you have the bias section and you can see that's an adjustable uh bias that's uh, basically a very standard uh type of bias and it's just coming off the main supply uh, we don't have a dedicated bias supply in this so i had to come off the uh, i'll show you where it's coming off of here in a second actually uh, we just came off the main right here. This is a very standard uh, bias supply that I've built into here. I'm hoping this will be okay. I may end up having to change a couple values, but this should get us somewhere in the ballpark, uh, what we see there. Um, and I haven't even fired this thing up yet to see if it's even going to work. Uh, fingers crossed it will. Here is the new circuit. And as you can see, I mean, a lot has been done to this. The 6SJ7s, we have two different 6SJ7 circuits here. Uh, one of them is based on a, a fender circuit and a 
early champ, uh, 5C1. The other one is based on a uh, GA75 Gibson amplifier. Um, but, I mean, those are they're fairly standard sur SJ7 circuits anyway, but that's just where I kind of got the inspiration for each of these channels. They get mixed in uh, here. I may end up, you know, changing a lot of these values. We'll have to kind of see how this thing operates and then come back through. And that's the part that we're going to get into here in just a little bit. We're going to do our initial fire up. And then we're also going to get into kind of tweaking the circuit. But you can see here it goes through a, a gain pot on each of these channels. Uh, they get mixed together into this stage here, which is one half of a 6SN7. I changed that from an SC. Uh, the SN7 has individual cathodes for each triode, whereas the SC7 has just one cathode. So you couldn't use it as a cathode follower. Uh, you actually need both cathodes to be independent. So it didn't really take a whole lot of um, rewire to do that. So it, it made a whole lot of sense. So that's what we have going on here. We have a, a stage of gain going into a cathode follower, which is pushing the tone stack. The tone stack is modeled after sort of a Fender Princeton-esque kind of a simple uh, tone stack with just a treble bass and a fixed resistor for the mids. Then it goes into a master volume. So you're going to have a master volume on this amp. Uh, and that's right before the 6F6 that's driving the phase inverter which is not a tube phase inverter this is actually a transformer phase phase inverter transformer phase inverters were very common all the way up until the late 30s in fact they were the only kind of phase inverter that you would see on amplifiers up until the late 30s uh, that's because they the tube phase inverter really had not been invented yet uh, it would take uh, an inventor by the name of nat daniel nathan daniel to invent the tube phase inverter at least that's what i've traced it out to now i i uh, have done some research on this topic and it seems as if uh, nathan daniel of dan electro was the f and actually at the time he was building amplifiers for epiphone was the first to invent the tube phase inverter so basically everything that you would see before around this time before the 1940s or before the late 30s was going to be a phase inverter that had a uh a transformer instead of a tube but here are, we kept our 6l6g output we still kept the switch that was in place of course because we have all these options that's kind of cool to have those options and a pretty standard power supply oh and also we kept the 83 type uh rectifier tube which you know has that really cool kind of eerie glow and is uh, uh has the mercury vapor in it it's not a tube that's going to be easy to find if this one goes out, but it should last a good long while. I looked at the tubes that were in this amp, and the output tubes have a 1939 date code on them, as does the 6F6. I didn't see, I couldn't really translate the date codes on the rest, but I assume that they are also from the same time period, uh, from 1939. So this is straight up about a 1940 or 1941 amplifier so it's very it could even be pre-war for the u.s at least interesting circuit this was a interesting thing to mess with uh, i have to say i mean it was challenging there was a lot to rip out of it there was a lot to kind of think about and to uh you know I mean, with conversions you're just going to have that this is not you know if you to do a conversion right you know if you want to do it sympathetically to what's already there Instead of just ripping the, you know, ripping every, you could rip every single component out, you know, and probably start from scratch. And basically, the only thing that you would leave connected is the stuff for the transformers. Just leave this transformer stuff connected and rip everything else out or clip everything else out. And you would probably get something like this done a lot quicker. But the th And you could, you know, clone something that's already designed for you into a chassis like this and it would go a lot quicker. The problem is you would just end up with another cookie cutter uh, amplifier that just anybody could go and find, or you could go and get a, you know, another, another example of it somewhere else, and it just would not be unique. It wouldn't be interesting. You wouldn't have the same kind of talking points as something like this. That's, um, you know, this is a, a true one-off uh, boutique 
amplifier now. So, uh, and I've gone to pains to try to overvalue everything. So, I mean, we've got a 500 volt capacitor here at node two. Uh, we have uh, 900 volts total of handling here at the first node. So, you know, everything is just over, way over spec. The bias supply is all over spec. I, I used oversized stuff in the bias supply. We've got a, uh, a diode here that can handle uh, like thousands of volts. <laughs> so it's, it's probably never going to fail on you. So, and that's what we want. Uh, and all of the, uh, all of the power stuff, I used uh, two watt dropping resistors on all the uh, nodes so hopefully none of that will ever go out on you but this should be a pretty a fairly bulletproof amp that's the hope anyway and we'll plug it in here in just a second and we'll see if it even comes on this should be interesting to see if it even fires up the first time oh and one more thing i thought i should mention here is the final parts bag and you can see just how much crap that i pulled out of this thing that's that includes all of the the bits of Extra, I mean, we have so much crap here. As a matter of fact, let me dump it out. I'll put it in a different bag here, but this will give you a chance to see. And this isn't even all of it. You know, I threw away a lot of little things here and there, but I tried to keep all the, the main components so we could get an idea of how much crap I had to take out of this amp. But look, there, there are all of the casualties that had to come out of this thing. Uh, in order to get it to the state that it's in. But if you remember what it looked like before, I mean, you had, you know, you had all of these uh, additional wires and everything running to and fro. And like I said, they were just going everywhere. You had way too much of it. And I think it's a lot more slimmed down and sleek now. Definitely better for a guitar amp. Also, we have some wiring up here that was redone. The wiring that was going to the pilot lights, we had two pilot lights up here. Uh, the wiring was completely cracked off on this side leading into that light, so I had to replace the actual socket. As you can see right there, it has bare wire going down into the thing, so that, that wasn't going to work. So I replaced that socket, replaced all the wiring going to both of those. Of course, replaced the, uh, all of the tone stack stuff is up here uh, instead of underneath. Uh, I thought that the switch at first was bad on this thing, but I did test the switch later and it turned out to be okay. It must have been just something else. I hope I hope there's not any more problems in this that I missed. But I did ohm out all of the um, windings on all the transformers and everything, so hopefully those all should be good. The only thing I need now is a uh, 6SN7 tube that I need to go procure from my stash. So we'll pop one of those in there and then we'll fire this thing up and see what it does for us. Actually, before we fire up the amp, it might be fun for a minute to check out some of these old capacitors. Um, I thought these capacitors were pretty neat. Uh, some of these, these beaver capacitors, beaver dry etched foil electric, and these are made by Cornell Dublier. And they're definitely original to the amp, I'm pretty certain of that. Made in Plainfield, New Jersey. But uh, yeah, if there was ever a capacitor that you would want to uh, restuff, it would be certainly the beaver. Nice beaver. Thank you. I just had it stuffed. Let me help you with that. <laughs> let's uh, let's test. <laughs> let's, test. Um, <laughs> let's test them on this tester and see uh, see if they were any good. This one was supposed to be what. Uh, 40 microfarad at 150 volts. So this was uh, 70 microfarad. Uh, the ESR is pretty low, surprisingly. It's not even all that lossy. That's actually not that bad of a capacitor. That's pretty uh, unbelievable. But it's a dry. This is a dry electrolytic. Beaver. So this is probably still a, technically a good capacitor. And can you believe that? From, from 1940. So I would bet that if that one's good this one is probably also going to be good these capacitors are 80 years old i think it's usually uh pretty educational instructive and just kind of interesting and fun to test capacitors that have been around this long but look i mean same story here low esr uh not all that lossy i mean it's it's lossy you got some it's not perfect but it's still a good capacitor technically it's drifted way high. It's basically doubled in value, but that would still 
be a working capacitor inside the amplifier. So if this capacitor were to fail as a result of a, uh, of a or if this amp were to fail as a result of, capa of a capacitor, it wouldn't be that one. This one has been punctured on the side just by the way that it was in, in here. It was probably on one of the, um, shoved down on top of one of these pins and the pin just made its way punctured into the side. That probably destroyed this one, I'm sure. Actually, I'll kind of be shocked if it's not shorted. It's, can't be shorted. It's taken taken too long to test. Uh, unknown or damaged. Now this one, once again, this is one that if you were going to stuff a capacitor, this is one you would definitely want to stuff. <laughs> I just... Oh man, I've I've just been shut in way too long. This was one of the caps that was kind of downstream. Cornell Dublier Beaver Capacitor from 1940. Okay, now this is kind of more like what I expect. 29% loss, uh, 13 microfarad. But once again, I mean, even with these numbers, low ESR. So this thing would probably still work in the amplifier, technically speaking, and it would still actually do its job. And that's pretty, that's just pretty unbelievable. It's still actually registering as a capacitor and one that even, hasn't even drifted all that high. I mean, 24 microfarad at 500 volts. A 500 volt capacitor from uh, this time period, that would have been an expensive capacitor right there. And I didn't see any signs that indicated to me uh, that any of these capacitors had been changed. In fact, I think for the most part, the entire thing was original with the exception of the uh, the capacitors that were put in here. But the, the original ones had been left in. So we'll see what this one is. 24 microfarad is what it's supposed to be at 500 volts after 80 years. 45 microfarad, so it's drifted way high, but look, it's not that lossy. The ESR is low. That that capacitor right there is technically still good. I mean, if you were to put that on the amp and just and let it form up, that would probably still work after 80 years. These can capacitors like this, the ones that were made inside these metal cans, Typically, these have stood the test of time. I've, I've had a lot of these that turned out to still be good even after being an amplifier since like the 40s and 50s like this. This is not my first experience uh, having something this old still be good. This one's 310 microfarads. Let's test these. Uh, this one has a little bit of higher, e this is the highest ESR that I've seen yet at uh, 4.6 ohms. Low loss though. 15 microfarad, that capacitor would still probably work just fine. Like I said, it's still it's got a little bit of a higher ESR, but it's not it's not alarmingly high. Let's go to the second one inside of this. So this has got three caps in the same envelope here. And this one's just labeled capacitor type EP or FP. Okay, this one's drifted up to 19 microfarad so that's double its original value it's a little bit lossy not not bad though uh esr is at five ohms it would probably still do the job again we've just about doubled uh the the original value we are up to almost 20 microfarad uh the esr again is about at five ohms a little bit lossy but i mean you can see that just physically you can see down here where it's kind of bulged up a little bit right here in this area you can see where that cap is kind of bulged. But, if you were to fire this amp up, that cap right there, that can, would still be a good can. I mean, it would still function. Uh, this looks like it's had two of the three caps pulled out of it. I think that's what's going on here. This one looks about like the last one. No, that, that can't be true. No, this has just got one cap in it from the factory. It's, uh, that's just electrolyte that's leaking out right there. This is a 250 microfarad at 50 volt. Okay, so this one's doubled in value, uh, 530 microfarad. The ESR is low and the loss is, wow, I mean, look at that. Look at that. That's unbelievable. I mean, 
obviously it's drifted way high. And but that's to be expected. I mean, the thing is 80 years old, but the it, the fact that it would still function. This is a Tiger 1 micro uh, 0 0.1 microfarad by Cornell Dublier. Yeah, the ESR is way high on this. This this thing is this would have been the cause of some problems if this was a coupling capacitor. This might be a Cornell Dublier also. But look at the, you know, 7 almost 8% loss. All right, this one is an Aerovox. These were made in what Massachusetts somewhere? Right? Yeah, New Bedford, Massachusetts. 0 0.005 is what it's supposed to be. Oh uh, yeah, it's drifted. That's drifted high. Uh, it's not. That probably wouldn't be a bad capacitor though. It wouldn't hold up though. Now I'm not doing this to see which of these. You know. Uh, oh, I made a mistake. I should have left this in the amp. All of these needed to come out of the amp, regardless of how they test right now, because they just would not hold up. It's just interesting to me to see how they read uh, when you have something this old. And again, drifted high. Uh, and it's it's lossy, so I mean it's you know it needed to come out, and it would have failed eventually anyway. It's not worth, you know. Some people think, for whatever reason, that some old components they just have this magic power or something, and they just and they don't. Electronics, man, electronic components are electronic components. They do certain things to electrons. They prohibit their movement they direct their movement but beyond that there is no magic sauce in this stuff it's just if it's bad pull it out of the amp and don't hesitate um this one is a olson 0. 0.006 that man that was 800 volt rated wow um lossy as hell drifted high not not something you want to leave inside of an amplifier that one I can't even really clip onto, but I'm gonna assume it's probably bad too. But you get the picture. I mean, this is um, you know a lot of stuff that just needed to come out of an amp this old. But it's just hard to believe. It's really uh, shocking, actually, that uh, of all the electrolytics, only one of them tested bad enough where I could say assuredly that yes, that would have caused a problem. Another thing I wanted to mention real quick, if you work on an amp that's this old, a lot of the old cloth wire that you're going to be working with inside the amplifier is going to have asbestos uh, in the cloth covering. So if I were to strip back these wires, uh, you would see underneath, underneath some of this, you would have an outer layer of cloth, but underneath that, you're going to have also a layer of asbestos. So you know when you strip that back you need to be very careful that you don't aerosolize you know you don't break it up to the point where you've got these tiny particles of asbestos going everywhere uh, and you need to also uh, you know get get rid of all the remaining pieces of this stuff and probably not keep it all around I may keep a select few of these pieces that are in good shape like some of these uh, some of these pieces might be good for you know some kind of future project um, like a couple of these would be good for if I want it to look right, you know, in some other future project, that might be cool to keep around a couple of these pieces. Uh, but other than that, man, most of this stuff is going to go. Like maybe uh, maybe a couple of these black ones too that are in good shape. Um, I won't throw them all away. But this cloth covered wiring, uh, while it looks good and it looks the part in old equipment like this, it does have a risk. So you don't want to you don't want to just you know grind it up and start huffing it or something. You know it's got asbestos in it. So keep that in mind. Okay, here we go. Firing this thing up for the first time. I've actually already got it dialed up halfway. Uh, you can see there I've got 65 volts on the input uh 22 watts of power were drawn i've actually got some sound at the speaker i've got a signal fed into the front end here a 1k signal fed in here uh i've got our speaker plugged in over here our desktop speaker test speaker i'm just monitoring right now i've already uh i've already checked the voltages coming off the rectifier and and those seem okay I've got uh, voltage going into the rectifier, I've got them coming out, uh, and I'm testing right now the bias circuit because I don't want to want to screw that up. For I want to get that close in the ballpark so I don't, you know, overheat these 1939 6L6 tubes, basically. I don't want to destroy those. Um, and I've got 
41 volts negative where I should see it uh, where I should see my negative voltage and you can see here I'm able to adjust it with my little adjustment pot here so we're able to turn that we're going to be able to bias this thing where we need to bias it for now I'm going to leave it cold so we're going to put more negative voltage on the on that than we than we need uh, the original schematic called for 24 negative volts at that point at the bias point um, yeah right there uh, negative 24 volts so um, that's about what you know we're gonna see actually a little bit less uh, so it'll be actually a little bit more negative if I went off of the plates of the two so if I came off the plates we'll do that not the plates I mean the grids <laughs> that's what I should say the grid yeah right there it's a little bit for it's uh yeah, a little bit lower because you, it's going through the uh, going through the transformer to get to the to the tube grid, but it's not that much lower. It's just a tiny amount, so it's negligible, really. Um, but if we monitor right here, we should see roughly negative 24 volts. I'm going to leave it cold, like I said, until we get it all dialed up. But right now, it sounds like it's going to work. I've, I don't have this thing very loud. Um, I think really all we're going to have to do here now is. Uh, just bias this thing essentially because it's it's a rebuilt amplifier. This is ready to go it's, If I hit the channel one right here moment of truth And we've got sound Okay, obviously it's not going to be very loud because we don't have the we don't have the bias really where it should be at the moment yet And plus we're not run, we're only running this halfway up and that rectifier hasn't really gotten a chance to really start cooking. It really needs to get um, up to temperature to really do its job because of the kind of rectifier that it is. Oh, and also we had the treble all the way down. Probably the bass is all the way down too, I'm going to guess. No, the bass is up. But they do appear to be working. I just I need to get the chicken head knobs on them. So it's working for sure, um, and it, it actually, like I said, we can bias this thing. It should get louder also when I bias this thing a little hotter. And it definitely does, so um, I'm going to put it back to about 40 at the moment. We're going to play around with this. We'll adjust the bias, get it where it's uh, it needs to be, um, and check back with you. Also, while I'm at it, I want to go ahead and check the voltages at each of my nodes and just make sure they're where I would expect them to be. Right now, uh, 364 volts at no node number one, or on my schematic, it's actually uh, it's actually node E because I've got these in reverse order, so it's node E. So we'll check D next. So that's E. This is D. 363 right there. So we're good. Next node. This is node C, that's 238 volts, we're good there. Uh, here's node B, we're 208 right there. And here is node A. We're at 200 volts flat right there, and again, we're only at 89 volts on the input, so that will go up. Um, and again, rock steady on everything, all of our power and stuff is just rock steady let's see I want to check the plates of the six SJ sevens and those will be right here I've got 62 volts on that plate uh, the original schematic I think that's about right it was about 60 volts something like that um and yes 60 volts on on the original schematic and we may even like i said we've got a really really big uh plate resistor going into that so we may change that we may drop that about in half down to like a 220k or something like that we may also rebias these um this one in particular uh, this one i may just leave but this one in particular i may just rebias oh i didn't check channel two may as well go ahead and check channel 2. So let's do that while we're thinking about it. 
But listen to it without the input. It's dead quiet. Channel 2 is working just fine, so man, yeah, we're good to go. I'm very happy so far. Okay, there we are at 110, or 111, close enough. Drawing almost 80 watts of power in total, which is still really good. Where Our current right there is not excessive. Uh, it's well below the 3 amps that the fuse can handle, so uh, we're good there. Um, let's see if we can catch a glimpse of what this rectifier looks like. You can definitely see it down in here. You see that kind of ghostly blue glow down inside there. We do have a little bit of a little bit of microphonics on the output tubes. Uh, as I was tapping those just then, I uh, noticed that just a little bit. It's not too bad. You are going to have uh, some microphonics with this amp because you've got those six SJs right up front like that. Those are pentodes, and that slams a lot of signal through this circuit uh, right up front so that's that's to be expected you're you're not going to get away with uh you're not going to get away from that entirely i'm just shocked at how quiet this thing is there's no sound i always like to check uh transformers also to make sure that they're not hot and our power transformer is ice cold even though it's right next to the power tubes it's ice cold uh, the choke is ice cold. Output transformer, ice cold. I'm just, I'm thrilled with uh, how smoothly this is going, to be honest with you. Okay, uh, one last thing we need to do here before we can basically call this thing done is bias the output tubes. Uh, we are going to use one of my little homemade uh, bias probes. And I'm going to check one tube at a time. Uh, and you can see here the probe is between the socket and the tube. I will show you how to make uh, a set of these for yourself for about three bucks if you want. Uh, I'll put a card up here if you want to check out the video for that. All right, like I said, I'm just going to flip the power switch and we'll see how it goes with that. We got an inrush current, 520 volts DC right at the tube plate. And that's before everything heats up, so that's that's a lot of voltage. But uh, that's why I over-volted those first uh, couple of nodes so that it should handle it. Let's go ahead and turn this down a little bit. We should see our voltage go up as I turn this down, but I want to... Uh... Alright, 28.6 milliamps is about 14 watts. On a 6L6G, uh, 19 watts of plate dissipation is the maximum on a 6L6. So really, um, you want that by about 70%. So 19 watts times 0.7 is about 13.3. We're really close right where we're at. And we will leave it right there. Now, if we want to do any more fiddling with this to try to make the amplifier louder, we're going to have to go through and actually do some uh, changes on the biasing for each individual stage. Now, this didn't seem like it was very loud, but we definitely want to test it before we make any assumptions. But over here, we're looking really good in terms of you know our current draw and everything. You see 89 watts of power. Sorry, my stuff's in the way, but you can see what I mean. Current's good, power's good, everything looks good right right there. So the output is about perfect. Okay, so fast forward a little bit, and I've tested this thing out, uh, but it's a little on the quiet side. Um, it's not real quiet, but it's, it's a little quieter than I would expect from an amp of this, uh, this wattage. So... Uh, what we're going to do is we're going to redesign some portions of the circuit. The main suspects of why it would be quiet, um, there are a few things actually. First of all, these uh, the gain controls, uh, since these are mixed together here, these are actually in parallel to ground. If you notice from this point, there are two different resistors parallel. So they're interactive actually. These two gain controls are interactive. Because the two gains are parallel, you're actually chopping the the overall value in half when they are both uh, at their maximum. 
So that's a problem. Uh, and we need to address that for sure. Probably by upping the value of those to two megs each um, would be ideal. Dude, but I don't think that's all of it. Uh, we could go here, and I, I knew this going into it that we were going to have to do some tweaking on this. Um, but the inputs, just looking at these, uh, this is all probably okay. The biasing is okay. The input resistor is okay. Uh, here, one meg is good. Um, that's fine. So we could fiddle with this one for sure and find the maximum gain we could get out of that. This 500K plate resistor, though, this one and this one, these are two more suspects. There is going to be an ideal point at which you want a plate resistor. If you go too low, you're going to have uh, not enough impedance between this point and this point if you go too high you're going to have uh, too much and when you're feeding the plate resist or when you're feeding the plates with power the power is going to be too low so this there's an ideal at which this is going to be and i think 500k is too large we should probably consider chopping this value in half also this two meg resistor here and this one here these might be a little bit high as well. We may consider messing with those a little bit. Okay, a little issue here. One of these knobs will not come off. This thing is uh, also kind of busted on the side here. It looks like somebody else has tried to get this off in the past and tried to pry it and busted it partially. But it, this thing will not come off of this shaft. This It's either glued on there. I don't know. Um, and as much of a sh as a shame as it is to destroy a knob like that and have to replace all these knobs, I think I'm just I have re no choice really if I'm gonna do this. I think what they did, and it looks like there's a crack through here anyway. So this thing was probably cracked at one time, and somebody repaired it. But when they repaired it, they glued it, and then they put it on there before the glue had dried. So they glued it to the shaft, and there's just there's no way of getting that off there without breaking it. So. I mean, and the, the pot has to come off. Well, it looks like it was trying to come off of there. It's really trying, but... God, what a... Damn, that's a shame. What a bloody shame that is. God. Man. hate doing something like this, but man, it's just... There's just no way around it. It's... Somebody, somebody glued, and you can see, yeah, you can see the glue. Somebody glued the damn thing. I, why do they do that? God. Why on earth did they do that? They glued it on there. Yeah, we'll just... We'll just replace the knobs. It's just, we'll replace it with a matching set of knobs. Okay, I wanted to give you a kind of an idea of how I'm testing this thing and uh, how I'm trying to optimize the output on each stage. Uh, I've already done uh, this to uh, this stage and this stage, testing the bias resistors on these two. But right now I'm at the 6F6 bias resistor and what I've done here is I've clipped the bias resistor out of the circuit. I don't know if you'll be able to see it down there. Yeah there it is. So I've clipped that resistor down there out and I've uh I've in, in its place I have put this little box here in this box I can select uh different I can select different resistors um in place of the value that was there. So the the value that was there originally was a 2k and I want to see if there are any resistors that will uh, suit this circuit better. So one point, so two K is actually lower in volume than the one than one K. Uh oh, something's burning. 
something's burning. What the fuck is burning? I think 1K is the value to go with here. If I go too much higher than that, uh, I think it's going to throw my bias way, way off. math later okay so I said I had smelled something I thought might have been burning at one point and it turns out I think this first dropping resistor in the power supply this one here if you could see I don't know if you could tell it or not on screen but it's slightly discolored already uh, no longer than I've been testing it out and I think that's the source of the smell that I was smelling uh, we've got really too much current being passed through too small of a resistor so I'm gonna up the value um, the wattage handling of the resistor but I'm also probably gonna adjust the value slightly and in order to determine what the value needs to be uh, on this side of the node uh, this is the going to the plate of the 6F6 tube which typically uh, is used as an output pin toad in you know radios and so forth but in this one it's the phase inverter driver so uh, in order to determine what this should be I'm going to look at some examples of uh, 6F6 normal operation we're gonna come right up to the maximum plate dissipation for the 6F6 and we're gonna set it right there so it basically will be set at maximum uh, I know that this value probably needs some adjustment because it's just dropping too much voltage through too small of a resistor probably adjust this down from 10k to maybe 1k so we're going to use the bias probe on this so this will measure our plate current this one will be measuring our plate voltage so let's go ahead and uh, fire it up on the variac and see what that is for this phase inverter tube I did test this this thing out on a cabinet and so far it sounds really really excellent I do think there's still probably room for improvement as well so we're going to fiddle with a couple of values and the main one is we need to set that power supply right because if the power supply is not right then nothing else is going to be right okay so now we're at our full 120 volts right there we got 92 watts of, com of total uh, dissipation 245 volts and we're at 17.6 on the current in milliamps so let's do the calculation 17.6 and 245 volts should give us the uh, plate dissipation for this tube so 245 times 0 0.0177 which is what this is uh, gives us 4.33 uh, watts of plate dissipation for the 6F6 tube which is way too low so we need to uh, like I said definitely do something about that so we need to experiment with that dropping resistor and change that plate voltage okay so for a 6f6 uh, running in triode mode that gives us 10 watts of total plate and screen dissipation so that's what we need to aim for right there is about 10 watts and we're at about half of that at the moment so let's uh, let's adjust so let's actually start by adjusting that dropping resistor okay I've got that 10k resistor clipped out of the circuit and I have instead a 1k 5 watt resistor Okay, we're up over 100 watts now for the total 
in the amplifier and we're almost at one amp so it's definitely drawing some more current and uh, the wattage has gone up in total which I kind of would have expected uh, but we're at 416 volts 31.7 uh, milliamps of current okay so that puts us at 13.22 and the tube would not survive long at that so let's go ahead and kill it okay let's try a 5k at 5 watts now so the current is way down from where it was and the voltage seems awful low though too you can see there we're at 96 watts total 0.9 amps of current we may be on on target here well maybe close at least uh, we're at 7.2 watts of plate dissipation now which is 70 percent of the 10 but I don't think we would really need it at 70 percent okay so two 5k's in parallel is going to give us about two and a half k so let's try that now okay so we're settling down to about 374 volts equals 10.4 so we're a little bit over but that's probably pretty close that's probably about where uh, we would need this to be we might actually just stick with this right here and that should uh, get us a lot more oomph out of the amp overall the other thing I need to address in here at this point uh, is the fact that my negative feedback resistor is getting crispy and I'm not exactly sure why so I need to figure that out some final cleanup on this circuit just making sure everything is okay uh, these two 5 watt resistors that I put in the power supply in parallel are 5k each for a total of 2.9 it's about 2.9 or excuse me about 2.3k is what they come to in real measurements uh, also, uh, you can see right here, I'm measuring the voltage drop across that those two resistors, and it's about 93.7 volts voltage drop. So using those two figures, we can calculate the actual uh, wattage, uh, the actual dissipation in watts um, across that point and see if that uh, configuration right there is appropriate and if you don't want to do this yourself I mean if you don't want to do the calculations on a calculator you can do it like this this is the 21st century after all you can go to ohms law calculator.com and you can just put in these values so um, you can scroll down you can put in the voltage drop so we'll put in uh, what do we say it was 94.24 volts 2300 ohms of resistance so we should be able to just calculate that it's going to give us the power so the power in watts is 3.8 watts so we're good there we've got uh, we've got two 5 watt resistors in parallel for a total of 10 watts of handling so we're way we're way good on that all right and one final thing I want to do uh, just for my my own purposes really uh, more than anything is to include the voltages on this schematic so I'm gonna write down at each node the voltages uh, at that node okay so there we go there's the final schematic complete with all of the changes and uh, yeah if you want to save that or use it for any reason you're obviously welcome to you can uh, build one of your own <laughs>
Thank you.